It's Andy Pool versus the Wolverine. Or with the Wolverine. Yeah. Andy Pool and Wolverine. That's what it is. Clayton Safety from the Wolverine joins us. We have a lot to talk about, Clayton. We were just going to get together and talk about Michigan practice. Who's going to play quarterback? Not now. Not anymore. Yeah, every time this seems to happen, uh, when we have real football to talk about, good football to talk about, uh, something with the NCAA comes up. So throw it at me. I know you got all sorts of ideas and questions, so let's do this. I have many thoughts, many, many thoughts. So uh, Dan Murphy and Pete Thamel from ESPN got a draft copy of the notice of allegations involving the Connor Stallion stuff at Michigan, which uh, Chris Ballas, uh, your colleague at the Wolverine, reported last week was was coming and was was going to be soon. And so here's what we know from what ESPN has reported, that they have some deleted text messages by Sharon Moore uh, that were deleted, but they were recovered using phone imaging. And also he turned them over. So he's accused of a level two violation. And, and, and the ESPN story, very quick to point out, this is a draft copy, so it may have changed between now and when this was drafted. Uh, but so that, that I mean, because everything before we were wondering about Jim Harbaugh and all that, but Jim Harbaugh is gone. Like Sharon Moore is there, has just been promoted to head coach, and he is caught up in this thing. So what does that mean for Michigan right now? Yeah, it's. I was thinking the same thing, Andy, where when I'm reading this, um, and like you said, we kind of knew – this was coming, but the big key all the way and Jim Harbaugh released a statement, what, like a day or two after it comes out that the NCAA is investigating Michigan, the big tens looking into it. Obviously they end up suspending Jim Harbaugh. The whole thing was, did Jim Harbaugh know? And in here it says, you know, they don't have any evidence that he did, but like you said, that's way less relevant than it was back in October and November last year. Now uh, all eyes are on Sharon Moore because he's the head coach of this program. And obviously rightfully so that, that you know, people are looking at what his potential involvement with the Connor Stallions stuff, as you said, or the investigation. Um, so the way it read to me is, you know, the same as kind of what you said: the fifty-two deleted text messages between Sharon Moore and Connor Stallions, which was one them. string, by the way, which is quite a conversation. Yeah, so I I don't know how that exactly does that mean they were in a certain period of time or is that could that be over months? I I, I don't know, but I think it was one string of te- I think it was a conversation that that uh, that was going on, you know, kind of in real time. But it, it doesn't really matter because the the fact that it's a level two violation and not a level one tells you the contents of said text messages probably weren't all that bad. Had now he deleted them in a way that they could have never recovered them. That's where you maybe get slapped with an unethical conduct, which is a level one. Like, so it, it that's the part I'm, I'm curious about because Sharon Moore in that draft notice was not accused of a level one violation. Jim Harbaugh was multiple other coaches were Charlie Partridge who got fired last year in the middle of all this. Uh, he got accused of him too, but that's, that's the part. I was curious about, but level two suggests, okay, maybe not as bad of an outcome, but again, it's still the head coach that's that's caught up in it. Well, I I think it's important to go over the timeline here too, because uh, they said that the texts were deleted the day that media reports came out that Connor Stallions was kind of the centerpiece of this this investigation, which uh, to my knowledge is at least a day or a day and a half after that Tuesday night before the Michigan State mm-hmm. game, when it came out that the NCAA informed the Big Ten that Michigan was under investigation for this, uh, then Michigan obviously gets notified at the same time, hey, you're under investigation for you know alleged off-campus scouting. Um, so at that time, I assume Sharon Moore, other staff members are probably told, hey, don't do anything. Like We're probably going to have to turn over devices. Again, this is an assumption by me. Uh, so I think that's why it's important that the texts were deleted and he could receive a level two violation for it. As you said, if, you know, Sharon Moore was directly involved with whatever Connor Stallions was doing, I would assume that would have been a level one violation. And as you also kind of alluded to, it might've been a blessing that they were able to recover these text messages through the device imaging, uh, because otherwise he could never prove, even if they were innocuous, that they were innocuous. Right. Um, So that's kind of an interesting part of it. Yeah. And he turned him over too, which also like that, 
implies some level of cooperation. So, uh, whereas, you know, Jim Harbaugh did not turn anything over. And right. yeah, we, we've heard from Jim Harbaugh's lawyer, Tom Mars, about all the stuff they actually asked for. They wanted, they wanted phone communication from the lawyers, stuff like that. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot, but this will all be really interesting to see it play out because this is the notice of allegations. Michigan, when it gets the with you know has the actual notice of allegations, not a draft copy, uh, they then get a period of time before they have to respond. Uh, they'll send a response. The NCAA will then set a hearing date. I'm looking at this and just marking the time on this, Clayton. They can get through the season without really having to deal with any fallout from this yet, and. Because I'm just thinking of the Sharon Moore piece of it. Well, we can get to any you know postseason ban, all that stuff. Because Chris Ballas reported that, that the NCAA might seek one of those. But let's talk about the Sharon Moore part of it. So I have an idea. I have a thought, and you let me know if this is crazy or not. Let's go. Let's go. We have precedent because remember the there's another NCAA case involving Michigan, and that's the one the recruiting stuff. Jim Harbaugh that he served a a three game suspension for at the beginning of last season and not at the end of last season, which was for this thing, but at the beginning of last season, he served a three game suspension. And the hope was that that would be enough. If Jim Harbaugh remained employed by Michigan, that he wouldn't get suspended anymore. And so that's how a lot of these, these things happen. You do the preemptive one and you hope that the committee on infractions is cool with that. And they don't suspend you anymore. Now I have no idea what, this stuff would merit in terms of a suspension. We'll we'll go with the three games because that's what Michigan did for, for the Harbaugh thing. So I'm looking at the 2025 schedule. Now, we do not have an order of games from the Big Ten yet, but we can assume the Ohio State games at the end of the year, that it's not yes. at the beginning of the Big Ten schedule. Yep. And also, it doesn't apparently matter if Michigan's coach is suspended for the Ohio State game. Uh, but they open with New Mexico. And I'd say suspend him for that one preemptively. But week two for Michigan in 2025 is at Oklahoma. Sharon Moore's alma mater. Yes. Huge game. You can't suspend him for that if, if it's your choice. Like if the NCAA says you're suspended for this, there's nothing you can do about it. But if you're doing the preemptive one, so here's what I say. You let him coach those two games. And then you suspend him for the next three Beginning with, drum roll please, the most perfect game to possibly be suspended for, in this case, Central Michigan. I didn't even think of that as you were, like, I, I'm have, looking at the schedule right now. And I didn't even make the connection. I'm an idiot, but that's fantastic. <laughs> and it's how many head coaches? It's, per- it's poetic. How many head coaches replaced your own more? Three or four for those three games? What, what would it be? I mean, well, you you're going to have two Big Ten games in there. So we really don't know. Okay. We know who the Big Ten opponents are. We do not know the order they will be placed in. So we, I mean, we know where Ohio State's going to fall, but they, they do play Washington, Wisconsin, Nebraska, USC. Obviously, they play Michigan. I would assume Michigan State will be in the, in the usual spot calendar wise. So. Yep. Like you're probably not going to miss the Michigan State game. You're not. You're definitely not going to miss the Ohio State game. So I mean, you can kind of roll the dice and hope that that he's not suspended for for Wisconsin or USC. But you know, if he is, again, we watched Michigan win a national championship with the head coach was suspended for six games, including Penn State and Ohio State. We did, and um, you know, maybe it was just an incredible thing, and maybe that that's Sharon Moore and in, in part of how special of a coach he could end up being. Um, and that was a special team too, obviously with a ton of veterans. I mean, guys like Trevor Keegan and Zach Zinter and, you know, Blake Corum don't need their head coach. I mean, we, no one knew really, it was kind of unprecedented, right? In the biggest games of the year, do you need your head coach? What's the value on game day of your head coach? And maybe it would have given them seven more points or, you know, more poise or confidence and things that you can't measure, but you're right. Um, the new president has been set as uh you know you texted me earlier i did not delete those texts by the way so i still have them i could good them very good too, in but, case someone asks um, yeah so it's it, it's kind of crazy to think about in next year you know in really every year going forward you're going to have these tough schedules so you would hope that uh if you're michigan you don't have to suspend your head coach um but but like you said i think it would easily be 
if there's a penalty like this, 2025, 20, 26, something like that. Because as you know, these things obviously drag on quite a bit. Yeah, and that's why I would do it in that way where you you do it ahead of any – you say, we, we're suspending him for these these three games or whatever it is. You announce it, and you do it ahead of a committee on infractions meeting, and that way in the hearing you can go, hey, we've already suspended him for three games. You guys don't need to do any more than this, which is what a lot of schools try to do. We'll see what happens. I, I, I'm much more interested in, in a potential post-game ban. I think that's much – you know, farther reaching and, and a much bigger consequence than anything else. Uh, Chris Ballas reported no potential vacation of wins or, or, or vacating the title or anything like that. I don't think that matters. Like there's probably some Michigan fans who, who would be very upset if they had to vacate the national title. I don't think that matters. They want it. They've, they've gotten all the financial benefits from winning it. Everyone knows they want it. Everyone saw they want it. It's on YouTube. If you'd like to watch them win it, like, whether you can hang a banner or not is completely irrelevant. Uh, but them banning them from the postseason in a future year is, is relevant. It would be a problem. So I would assume, Clayton, given what we saw in terms of Michigan's resistance last year, that they would fight pretty hard against that. Yeah, I think so. And, and Chris also reported that, that even if the NCAA did seek something like a postseason ban, Michigan would not expect that to end up happening or you know they certainly wouldn't let it happen without a fight so you know I think that's that's really important to note and, and uh, you know I tend to agree you know it seems like the postseason bans aren't necessarily the way the NCAA is going as of late and in terms of vacated title um, you know I, I would see that as unlikely too I do think Michigan fans would care um, but you know like we like you said we saw with our own two eyes you know what happened on the field last year we saw what happened when Michigan was at their own disadvantage at, at a certain point without Jim Harbaugh. I mean, you know, without Connor Stallions, I guess you could say as well. And, you know, with Sharon Moore having to step in his head coach and, and all of that. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the penalties will come at some point down the road. Um, a big fine, I think is something Michigan fans and the, the school would be willing to accept as well. And does, does that seem the most likely to you, um, you know, in terms of... Well, I, I, a fine's going to happen, but they're going to want... The NCAA is going to want something that makes it hurt. And that's why I would think that they go after them, you know, for the postseason ban. But here's the thing. If Michigan really doesn't want a postseason ban, they can go scorched earth on the NCAA. We've seen that. Uh, you saw Tennessee do it recently where... The NCAA is like, we're going to look into Nico's NIL deal. And Tennessee's like, we're going to have our attorney general sue you, and you're going to have to completely give up your NIL rules. And so the NCAA has to be somewhat careful with these big name brand powerful schools because they don't want to go to court with them. They really don't want to go to court with them. So yeah. it, it, it'll be very interesting. Now, we'll be right back with more Michigan talk with Clayton Safety, the Wolverine. And we'll talk about the Wolverines on the field. And guess who they play on the field at the big house? Texas in week two. And you can be there with game time. That's right, game time. The best place to get all of your tickets, whether they're for sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, you name it. They've got it on the game time app. Download the game time app. Use the code STAPLES for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. But you want tickets? To Texas at Michigan, you can get them on game time. They're hard to get anywhere else, but they got them on game time. We're, we're going to talk Florida in a few minutes. Florida opens the season in the swamp against Miami, one of the biggest non-conference games of the year. I call it a pitchforks and torches game because whoever loses, the fan base is going to completely melt down. Well, guess what? Game time has all your tickets to that as well. Open the app. Look at where you'd be sitting in the stadium. You can actually see your vantage point in the stadium. Easiest way to do it. Couple taps, that ticket is yours. It's your first purchase. Use that code STAPLES for 20 bucks off. Terms apply. Hey, we're also going to talk Kansas State. Speaking of non-conference games, they play at Tulane. You want to go to New Orleans? You want to have some Giacomo's? Some Panay Rabbit at Giacomo's? And then go watch a football game? Get those tickets on game time for Yuleman Stadium, Kansas State at Tulane. They're all there for you. So easy. 
Last minute tickets used to be a problem. Used to have to worry about going to scalpers. Nope, not anymore. Game time has what you need. Doesn't matter the game. They got the tickets. Go to game time now. Use that code staples and get $20 off your first purchase. Before we move on to actual football, there was one, one part of this that I just loved because one, I, I'm still, I'm cautiously optimistic about the Connor Stallions documentary that it's going to be fun, that he's going to mention, he's going to explain the vacuum cleaner thing and, or that he's going to explain the central Michigan thing, which by the way, this did say they determined it was him at central Michigan. Great detective work there, but <laughs> What I want to know, the, the part in the in the the ESPN report, the draft copy, of the NOA that I found fascinating, is that mm-hmm. Connor Stallings had like a team of interns working for him, and he had convinced them that what they were doing was not against NCAA rules. <laughs> and like now, I want to know, like I want a a like office style mockumentary on Connor Stallions' crack commando team of interns. Yeah, it's like. Um... What did they call it? The annex in the real office where it was kind of that separate part of, of the yes. TV show. And it's like, so he was running that with like Kelly and Ryan. It was chaos back there. So uh, I feel like that's kind of what, you know, could have been going on there. And, you know, I, I will say this, like, I, I do believe this from obviously following this story and covering it very closely last fall. And, and since then, you know, I do think that Connor Stallions believed you know, throughout, and, and it wasn't just interns that went to some of these games. It was also, right. you know, I believe it came out that it was friends. I mean, there was there a report there. Maybe I'm just thinking of like someone's theory because you get it all mixed up in your head, but like maybe his mom went to a game. Like, I think <laughs> I, I would think love that. that mom. Here's how you hold the phone when they're on offense. Just make sure here's, you look at the guys in the weird colored hats. Yeah. Go to Iowa uh, Northwestern. How much do you really love me? Will you go to Iowa <laughs> Northwestern? for me? So, um, but I, I do have, I'm under the belief that Connor Stallions does believe that he was exposing a loophole. Um, I, I do believe that from, from kind of what we've heard. So, um, you know, whether or not, unfortunately, he did, it, it was a pretty it clearly like written. Rule. <laughs> right. So the notice of allegations is now out. Right. Um, and, Clearly, it was the bylaw 1161 that was in question here. They're obviously going to, you know, charge or accuse Michigan. I mean, uh, it's not final stages yet of, you know, committing this this violation. So but I, I think it's worth noting, too, that, you know, when yeah, he did get other people involved, they believe they were following NCAA rules. And I think to an extent, he thought that there was some sort of loophole there, at, at least uh, from the way I understand it. Well, unfortunately, we will not get much more Connor Stallions content, you know, beyond the net, the Netflix documentary. I think, I think that's probably wow. it. I don't know that he's going to get to work for another team. Maybe no. the chargers. Like what if the chargers hired him? How awesome would that be? Special I mean, attache to the head coach. There was a director was of advanced gra- scouting. There was a graphic out there when Harbaugh interviewed, you know, they have to announce like we've conducted an interview with Jim Harbaugh. Someone made a fake one that, We've conducted an interview with Connor Stallions for for special scout, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, they actually have advanced scouting departments in the NFL. There are people who do that. So the man has a gift. We know. But we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. But, but now let's move on to the actual field because I am fascinated not about Michigan's defense because I think Michigan's defense is probably going to be awesome. Uh when you look at what they bring back, especially up front, uh, there's a nice picture of Mason Graham right there. Kenneth Grant, my favorite football player in college football this year, probably. Uh, you've got the two. You, you got the two edges that blew up the last play of the Alabama game. You've got Will Johnson, your number one ranked overall player in NCAA. Oh, not not called NCAA football anymore. EA College Football, EA Sports College Football 25. So great defense. Let's talk offense. Who's quarterback going to be? Andy, I think it's it, it's so weird to say, but it, I think it's as wide open as it really could get with three contenders, Alex Orgy, redshirt sophomore, Davis Warren, redshirt junior, and seventh-year senior, self-proclaimed grandpa of the team, Jack Tuttle, who started his career back in 2018 at Utah, spent several years at Indiana, and now has been at Michigan for about a year and a half. I, I think it's so wide open that Kirk Campbell said before fall camp last week that they were going to 
you know, divvy up the reps or at least order the reps on day one, oldest to youngest, right? And there are only a <laughs> finite amount of reps. I know you have a full month, but uh, that tells me it's wide open. Jack Tuttle was hurt in the spring, so he's certainly going to get have his shot. Um, but I also don't think that the answer to your question is necessarily going to be one name because as Kirk Campbell came on our podcast a couple of weeks ago and and he said that Alex Orgy, who's you know a freak athlete, he was you know number forty seven freak in in the country last year according to Bruce Feldman or whatever it was, um, is one of the best eleven players on the Michigan offense and they're going to have a role for him no matter what. That led a lot of people on the outside to believe that it's going to be Jack Tuttle or Davis Warren, two guys that pass the ball a little bit better, at least have a more of a track record doing so um, with Alex Orgy playing a role as well. It's kind of what I've thought all along. Um, but I, I also think Alex Orgy is going to have a chance to win the job himself outright. So I know that's me hedging, but I, I just think that it is, it's that open. Um, it's going to be it, important for them to find out who that guy is soon or soon ish because you do have a tough yeah. schedule right away you want to be able to find your identity and each guy is a different skill set that you have to build around it sounds a lot like the alabama competition last year with with maybe a little more experience because of jack tuttle but i, I mean tyler buckner had some experience in that but that was that was Jalen milro tyler buckner ty simpson all of whom brought kind of a different skill set to the table and then they didn't they they went with milro they had the little experimental game against USF where they let the other two play. And they're like, yeah, see, Milrose the guy. Like, it's almost like what, what kind of offense do you want to play when you pick between these three? It, it is. And it's, you know, Kirk Campbell described it as, hey, we have this, this pot of plays as an offense, formations and different things we want to do that all of them can do, right? They have to be able to do these things if you're going to be the Michigan quarterback. But then if it's Alex Orgy, we're going to enhance this little – you know, corner of the offense as well and kind of build it out from there. If it's Davis Warren, you do it with a, you know, different set of plays uh, or things that you want to do. And same thing with Jack Tuttle, who's kind of, you know, mobile, but also, you know, has a, a bit of an arm, but is, is unproven. He started five games in the big 10 at Indiana uh, against tough teams. I think like four of them were against top 15 teams. He's one in four as a starter, but that was with the talent at Indiana against, you know, in, in a tough situation, filling in for, injured players like Michael Penix Jr. So um, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what they want to do offensively if, you know, none of uh, or neither of Jack Tuttle or Davis Warren is, you know, head and shoulders better as a passer than Alex Orgy, then probably you go with him because you know that he's going to have dynamic ability as a runner. But those calculations are, are going to be tough to make and Michigan's going to have to make them here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and, and the question is, how do you replace all that you lost in the offensive line and know what you, cause I, I think if you knew more what that offensive line was going to be, I think they'd have an idea of what it's going to look like. But if you knew how well they were going to play or could kind of predict how well they were going to play, it might help you decide on a quarterback. But it, it's interesting because it, they lost their top six offensive linemen to the NFL last year. They've still got two guys that have over 20 collegiate starts. Like that's that's how deep they were last year. Yeah, and and I was doing the math the other day. I wrote about it, and I don't have it in front of me. But there are about ten players on this offense that have started a game in college. So it's not like you know these guys don't have experience. It's not like they they didn't contribute. Like Tyler Morris, who's going to be their lead receiver most likely, um, was a starter last year. If Michigan was in eleven personnel, the thing is they were in twelve personnel quite a bit with two tight ends, and so he technically wasn't out there for the first snap. Uh, you know, in most games, I think it was four or five games he was. So uh, it's the same thing on the offensive line. Miles Hinton, uh, the guy, you know, that one of the guys you're mentioning at left tackle, he played a bunch and, and started uh, nearly a couple dozen games at Stanford. He started the year as Michigan starter at right tackle last season. So at one point, Michigan thought that he was better than some of the other guys that ended up going to the NFL last year. I think that's encouraging. Josh Preeb, at left guard, you know, started a bunch and was a captain at Northwestern. And then there are a bunch of guys too at center and the right side of the line that have been at Michigan waiting their turn for a while. And if Trevor Keegan or Zach Zinter went to the NFL before last season, they would have been starting. So um, it, it's important to know. And they're old. Um, you know, uh, Andrew Gentry is a junior, you know, projected starter at right tackle. He's, I, I was just looking it up um, and I didn't finish my research before we went on here. I think he's 24, 25 years old because he took a two-year mission 
uh, in Utah coming out of high school. So they have guys that have been around that are old, that are physically developed and mature, been in the weight program that I think can step in. But how good are they going to be and how good are they going to be? How quick um, is a huge question because, again, the, the schedule's tough right away. Yeah, yeah. The Texas game changes the math on a lot of this because you know, last year we saw them, or, you know, or two years ago we saw them have a, a quarterback competition between JJ McCarthy and Cade McNamara. That you know, we kind of knew. It felt like it was rigged to just show everybody that JJ was the guy because you can't just replace the guy who led you to a Big Ten title like that. But they had a, a kind of ease into the situation you know, ease into the season situation where they could do that. They also had the same thing last year where they could suspend Jim Harbaugh for three games and do the same thing. Texas comes to Ann Arbor week two. You can't really be experimenting at that point. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i fascinated to see how this shakes out, Clayton. Me too. And, and, you know, like you said, you could do the Alabama thing where you do pick a quarterback if he struggles, you know, you, you possibly do some more experimenting, but I don't think they want to do that. And you certainly, once you pick a guy for Fresno state on August 31st, that's gotta be the guy barring injury that you roll out there the next week. And again, they might play multiple guys with Alex orgy kind of factoring in. Um, then you experiment if things don't go well, but they got to figure out what exactly their plan is. Stick with that at least for the first couple of games. And then you kind of go from there. Yeah. It, it's going to be a very different kind of season because of that Texas game. And it's very, very different than what we've seen the last couple of years from Michigan. But, you know, yeah, after that Texas game, you get Arkansas State, but then USC and then Minnesota, yeah. which is not going to be easy. And then you're at Washington. So it's like, I don't know. It's it's a much more difficult schedule than what we've seen the past couple of years for Michigan. And it's certainly not nearly as backloaded. It's it's kind of balanced all the way through. And yeah, I, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm sure. uh Sure, it's not much fun for those folks dealing with the NCAA stuff, but hey, they do have a national championship that they can uh, dry their tears with if, if it's that bad. So I think they'll be all right. Clayton Safey, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.